it's a little bit crazy why we don't, right? And we know that there are way more people in agriculture who actually don't have an estate plan and who really don't even have a secession plan in place than do. And it's mind blowing to me because you have spent your entire life, right? All of your money, probably all of your time, all of your effort, you have sacrificed so much. You have poured in all of this blood, all of this sweat, all of these tears into this asset, essentially. And so to me, why wouldn't you do everything you could to protect that asset that you have given literally everything to in most cases? Hey, hey, I'm Shay Keister, and I'm your host for the Casual Cattle Conversations podcast, where we connect you with members of the beef industry who can help you build a more profitable operation. As you listen to each episode, be sure to set an intention for the show. What do you want to get out of it? And how do you want to use this information to make changes on your operation? If you're looking for more ranching resources outside of what's being shared on these podcast episodes, sign up for my free weekly newsletter. I'll send ranching information and podcast episodes straight to your inbox every week. In addition to that, you will also receive a free PDF with 22 ranch management tips from the gurus who have been on my show. The link to sign up for that is in the show notes. With that, let's hear from our guests today and discover how we can improve the beef industry and our own unique cattle operations. Hey folks, I've got a quick message from our friends at the Red Angus Association of America, and we're going to talk about the cow, because on her shoulders rests the genetic basis of any cow herd. It's a weight she carries effortlessly year after year, so it's no wonder they call her the foundation female. It's critical she measures up to your expectations for longevity, performance, and fertility. Now, how can you create more high-quality females while eliminating the intensive time, guesswork, and upfront costs that accompany heifer development? Well, progressive producers can elevate their herd by enrolling in Red Angus Red Choice, a program designed to aid in developing the highest quality heifers through genomic testing, AI technology, and veterinarian partnerships. Heifers that meet the criteria are more likely to stay in the herd, propagate the best genetics, and make a positive impact on your bottom line, which is increasingly more important as input prices soar. So learn more about the Red Choice program and capitalizing on your female's genetic potential at redangus.org. All right, Casey. Well, thanks for joining the show today. You've been on my list for a while to have on, and we're going to talk about succession planning, which I know is, well, should be an important conversation for all cattle producers, but um, is especially close to your heart as well. So before we kind of dive into that topic, can you kind of talk about, you know, your role in the industry? You're a Jill of all trades, you've done a lot of things. So talk a little bit about what you're doing in the beef industry today and kind of your experience with succession planning and other careers as well. Absolutely. And I'm excited to finally get to be here with you. So this is an exciting day for me too. But so in a previous life, before I came back to the ranch full time about six years ago, um, I did a lot of different things. I worked in higher education for a long time. I was an extension agent for several years. And so professionally, I had the opportunity to work with succession planning and estate planning and kind of having some of those conversations with the producers in my area who would come in and ask questions and want advice. I also worked a little bit with a leadership education and development program for people who were associated or directly in agriculture. And so, you know, one of the big sessions that we did with them was focused almost entirely on estate planning and succession planning and having those conversations. So I did have kind of this professional background in it before it became something very personal to me. Um, My family actually got involved in estate planning um, back in the late 1990s, early 2000s, when we knew my grandmother was probably going to pass away soon. And just being in the position of understanding that we were not financially capable of being able to inherit land and absorb those estate taxes that we were gonna have to pay those inheritance taxes. And so 
you know, we set up or my dad and my grandma sent up, set up a very simple limited liability company. Didn't have a lot of bells and whistles, um, but just as a way to be able to transition and pass that land and, and keep it in the family. Um, I'm generation number four here on the family ranch. I work, you know, with my dear sweet daddy -o, who's about to be <laughs> 79. And so it's, it's he and I, and so there's a lot of history here and you hate to see that go away just because you couldn't hold on to it. Um, and since I've come back home, you know, I've had the opportunity to really dive into advocacy for the industry. I spend a lot of time on particularly Instagram where we just kind of share our life or I share our life and what we're doing here on the ranch. Um, I've had the opportunity to go through, you know, the top of the class program, which is an extension of MBA, I've had the opportunity now this year to serve as a trailblazer representing the National Beef Checkoff. Um, and then in my spare time on the side, I try to have a speaking business where I travel around the country and speak to groups about, in particular, this area I'm passionate about, which is the importance of estate planning and really share what can happen to you if you don't do it and maybe don't get it right the way that you should. Well, thank you for talking about your background. You do a lot of different things and you're a travel addict as well. So I enjoy following along on your adventures on Instagram. No, and that's 10 miles past nowhere, correct? It is. I don't know if you're recording this, on my shirt, the number 10 miles past nowhere. Um, it's a very apt description of where we live. <clears throat> so <laughs> that's, that's why I came up with it. And that's in Wyoming, correct? We are, yep. We live in Southeast Wyoming. All right. So, you know, you brought up that there's succession planning and estate planning. Would you give simple definitions of the two and why they're different? Because I feel like sometimes when we have these conversations, they get lumped together, but there is a difference. There is. So succession planning is more about the people, like the who's going to take it over, um, the conversations that you navigate maybe with kids or grandkids or nieces and nephews about who is going to take over the ranch and are they prepared to do that? Do they have the management experience? Do they have the business background? Do they understand how to keep the books? Um, do they understand, you know, how to bring the crop in or raise the cows or whatever, and making sure they're prepared with all of those tools to kind of really manage and run the operation. That to me is what succession planning is. It's the next person in line, whereas estate planning is really about protecting the assets to be passed on, um, you know, the land, the machinery the livestock, maybe, um, whatever those things are that would be a part of a typical person's estate, those physical things that you need to transition on to the next person. And so the estate planning piece is really kind of, you know, maybe setting up a legal entity or a structure that allows you to be able to do that. It requires a lawyer and it requires some funding, whereas succession planning can be done in-house you know, with conversations just between you and your heirs, but an estate plan is going to require bringing in a lawyer to make sure that it's formalized and it's legal um, and all of those things are in place. Thank you for explaining that and, you know, saying that the estate plan requires a lawyer and the succession planning that can be done in-house or with a separate consultant if needed. I've seen it or heard of it being done multiple ways. So in your mind, you know, why should all producers care about having this estate plan? Why, when, you know, if it comes down to one thing, why should they care and have that in order? You know, I think for me, it's, it's a little bit crazy why we don't, right? And we know that there are way more people in agriculture who actually don't have an estate plan and who really don't even have a succession plan in place than do. And it's mind blowing to me because you have spent your entire life, right? All of your money, probably all of your time, all of your effort, you have sacrificed so much. You have poured in all of this blood, all of the sweat, all of these tears into this asset essentially. And so to me, why wouldn't you do everything you could to protect that asset that you have given literally everything to in most cases, 
to make sure that it can then carry on and do what you want it to do for the next generation to make sure that somebody can get it if there's somebody there who wants it. Um, you know, that's a whole nother conversation if you don't have somebody um, in line to be able to pass it on to. But to me, it's just about if you spent your entire life really fighting to hold on to this, in most cases, piece of land, why wouldn't then you do what you had to do to make sure that the next generation could enjoy that same piece of land and care for it and steward it just the way that you did. Because I think that's the dream of almost everyone in agriculture, right? We're all living this life because we want to see it passed on to the next generation. And so in order to do that, especially in today's climate, today's tax climate and today's political climate, we have to do the things that we need to do to ensure that that's going to happen. Well, I, I mean, those are all very good points. And on that note, it, it's not necessarily just agriculture. There are a lot of small businesses that don't have exit strategies either. And like you said, in some cases, there's not someone in the family to take it over. But in a lot of cases, there are. And, you know, having that in place, I've heard it from other um, individuals and consultants as well, is that when that is in place, it actually makes it more enticing for the younger generation to come back if they know that there is a future there and that they're going to financially be able to make it work. Uh, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's a phenomenal financial burden to come back and try to navigate paying the federal government, paying your state in certain cases. You know, if you live in the state of Wyoming and you don't have these kinds of things in place, the state of Wyoming is going to take a chunk of your estate and that's going to have to be paid for. You know, can you financially navigate buying out other siblings or other people if, if the you know, land is divided amongst different groups? And so, you know, I think part of estate planning, there's multiple pieces to it. It's, it's getting the legal structure in place to make sure that we're minimizing those inheritance taxes and being able to transition that on. But it's also things like making sure that the appropriate people have life insurance policies. So that when they do pass on, maybe because most of us don't have a lot of free cash laying around in agriculture or a small family business, um, if you live in urban America, certainly, you know, and so life insurance policies can be a great tool that I think often get overlooked in, you know, being able to provide that necessary income at that point in time to be able to make those financial expenditures to hold on to the asset. Absolutely. So would you talk a little bit about how you personally were impacted by estate planning? I mean, you have this story where you've worked on it on the professional side, but then it did happen to you on the personal side as well. So can you talk a little bit about that experience that you've had to overcome? Absolutely. So, you know, as I said, we started or I shouldn't say we, my parents and my grandmother started this estate planning process a long time ago. And so they set up the first of two LLCs that we, we now hold. And so after my grandmother passed away and my dad inherited um, her property, my, my, my parents had also bought a ranch on their own shortly after they were married. And so um, they set up another LLC kind of to put their own personal land into they decided they really wanted to have an estate plan buttoned up, you know, exactly how things were going to go when they passed away. You know, they went to the effort of setting up living trusts, not just having a will, but managing their assets so that when they passed away, everything would transition really smoothly to my brother and to myself. Um, my brother was the one coming back to take over the family ranch. And so, of course, you know, making sure he was going to be set up to be able to have a, a fully functioning ranch was important, um, but not wanting me to be, you know, cut out completely, you know, making sure I had a piece. And so they spent a lot of time, they spent a lot of money, um, you know, to get what they thought was a really buttoned up estate plan. And then it will be seven years ago this coming May. Um, my brother had just made the decision to come back to the family ranch and take it over. He was on his way home. He had gone to town and about five miles shy of the home place, his heart stopped beating and he ended up in a neighbor's pasture and that's eventually where they would find him. 
And so, you know, all of a sudden you are thrust into a situation you never want to find yourself in, right? Nobody wants to bury their child. Um, he was 31 years old. So no one expected this at all to, to happen. And so all of a sudden we realized that this buttoned up estate plan that they thought they had was in place if things went in the proper order. But when things didn't go in the proper order, we had some problems. And so when the child died first, we had some problems. Um, as you, you know, uh, we found out the day after my brother passed away that he was married to a woman that he had known at the time they got married, less than two months. Um, they had been married at the time of his death, less than a month. And so, you know, that was a situation we certainly hadn't planned for in our estate plan and what happened after that because of the decisions made by the person that he married, the way that the laws were in the state of Wyoming, all of a sudden we found ourselves in, in a mess. Um, you know, it is tragic and it is heartbreaking to have to grieve a loved one. And then all of a sudden you're compounded by this whole other nightmare that you could have never seen coming. And so for me, that's largely why I'm so passionate about this now is, you know, it's, it's easy to say no good will ever come from losing my brother. And that's always going to be a huge hole and a huge heartache um, and something that will never get past. But if I can use his death to make sure that I can share a story that maybe has enough impact to motivate people to go get this done and get it done right, to ensure that no other family ever has to go through what we went through, then I can bring some good out of losing my brother. And that's, to me, that's the best I can hope for. Well, I would say you're doing a lot for a lot of people by opening up and sharing this story. So thank you for that. Hey folks, I've got a quick question for you. Do you know the magical feeling that comes when things just work out? Like when the vet says all your cows are bred? Don't you wish you could feel that more often? Well, I'm here to tell you you can by using Cattle ID. With Cattle ID, you can store, share, and collaborate on your herd records from your mobile device. Yes, I said collaborate because multiple people on your operation can analyze and access this information at one time. So you can say goodbye to the back and forth miscommunication and misplaced records. And that's not all. Cattle ID also serves up actionable analytics to help you and your team make smarter, more informed decisions for your ranch. So let Cattle ID take some of the burden off of your shoulders and make ranching easier. You can get started online and learn more about Cattle ID by going to cattleidapp.com. And that link will also be in the show notes. So as you kind of look back, because you said it happened out of order, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty. looking back, what could have you done different in the state of Wyoming? Because states are different. You know, what could have you done different to help button that up even more because things happened out of order? So when people ask me, I'm, I'm going to answer your question, maybe not in the way that you exactly expect me to, but the number one piece of advice that I always give to people when they come up to me and they say, what, what's, what's the number one takeaway? And I always say, find the right lawyer. Find the right lawyer. Um, the lawyer that my parents chose, he was handy. He was local. He was a phenomenal lawyer in a lot of ways. But based off of my knowledge of estate planning, what I had gained professionally at that time, I would say he did not have a good understanding of agricultural estate planning. And he did not know what he didn't know. He didn't know what questions he was missing. He didn't know what situations he needed to plan for because he just really hadn't done, he'd done maybe a couple of these, but he hadn't done a lot of them. Mm -hmm. And so my number one piece of advice that I think really changes the course of everything. This is gonna take a lot of time and this is not gonna be cheap. And you don't want it to be cheap if in the end it costs you everything, right? It's better to pay what this process deserves 
and have it done right than to go the cheap route and suddenly find how many holes you're sprouting because odds are you're not going to know um, either. And so finding the right lawyer, you know, making sure you do your due diligence, ask around, talk to your state associations, see who they know who has had an estate plan done, who would talk to you. You know, the reality is in the world that we live in today, the best lawyer for you may not even reside in your own state. And people are always like, whoa, wait a minute, I can use a lawyer out of state. And the reality is so many of these lawyers that are really skilled in this field, they will be licensed in multiple states or they know a lawyer maybe in the state that you're in that they can team up with. So you can still get the benefit of the, you know, their experience and their knowledge. They can make sure they've done enough of these that they can help you get everything buttoned up and think everything through um, because that's their job. That's what you're paying them for. Mm -hmm. um, and to make sure that you get everything done that you need. And just talking, talking to people who have been through this, you will be amazed at how everybody approaches this differently. And it may spur thoughts and ideas and situations you hadn't even considered. So making sure you really do your due diligence um, in, in thinking this through, because this is one of the most important things that you're ever gonna do. And so you wanna make sure that you, you do everything you can to get it right. And if you have somebody, um, you know, my parents kind of left me out of this, this process for, you know, various reasons. And so, you know, for me, it's easy to look back and be like, if you had just asked me, I would have been like, this is a problem, but they didn't. And so, you know, take advantage of the people in your life who might have answers and talk to them before you, you sign off and you file these things to make sure you have it. And you're never gonna, you're never gonna plan for every eventuality, I, I know that. But the goal is to plan for as many as you can and have that all buttoned up in your, your estate plan. Well, that was a very good answer, even if you went about it your own way, I really appreciate that. And that did answer the question, so thank you. <laughs> I tend to do that, I just do things my own way, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I know, and I love that about you. <laughs> so, with that, when, when, and I mean, and I know you're not a lawyer and this is all speaking from personal experience, but in your it's eyes, normal. when do you make that estate plan? Because it can be complicated. Like I think about it, like my parents didn't know that I was coming back to the ranch until about a year ago. If that, I was still up in the air about some stuff too. So it's not, it would have been hard for them to make anything before that really with, you know, so there could have been challenges there. And a lot of that was made on the succession side too, not just the estate plan. But so when do you think people should start this process? Now, um, you know, here's the thing. An estate plan isn't static. It's not permanent. Now, may it cost you some additional money to go in and change it? Yes, but it doesn't have to be permanent forever. Um, and, and there are pieces of estate planning, I think, you know, part of the reason we were in the situation we were in is because my brother didn't have a will. I'm a firm believer, if you turn 18 years old, you need to go get yourself a will. Even if you don't have much of anything, at least start the framework. Wills are easy to update get yourself a will. Um, you know, the next step is, I think once you start to accumulate some assets, turn that will into a living trust. You know, I think there are a lot of states that require mandatory probate if all you have is a will. Wyoming is one of those states. Um, and I think there are a lot of states like that, right? Because the state wants a cut of your estate if they can get their hands on it. And so having a living trust eliminates the need to go through probate. And it makes sure that all of your assets end up with the people that you want them to. And again, it's a living trust. It's capable of being changed as you marry, as you have kids, as you know, things, relationships maybe morph and change or divorces happen or whatever the case. But but having that that next step. And then, you know, if you're talking about succession planning, I think having those conversations with people as soon as you can, it is so important. Um, because I think the quicker you start having those conversations, the easier those are. 
Um, I think some of the problems that we get into is we wait to have those conversations and then something happens that's going to make that conversation uncomfortable. And so we just don't have it, right? We just die and we hope that they're going to figure it out on the other side. Um, and, and not being able to have those conversations can do a lot of damage to the people who are left behind. So having those conversations openly and honestly with a mediator, if that's what it takes, you know, a lot of states have mediators on staff through their Department of Agriculture that will come in and help you navigate those conversations uh, to make sure that they stay calm and, and whatnot. But so that everybody knows, you know, and, and you kind of have a plan. And I think at bare minimum, get some sort of a state plan set up that at least protects the land. You know, because the land is probably the single most valuable thing that you have. It's the biggest thing you have. You don't have to put everything into your estate. The two LLCs that we have personally, the only thing that they contain is the land, right? My parents have maintained ownership of their cows. I have maintained ownership of my cows. My dad's got the machinery, et cetera, in, in his living trust. And there's still a, a path for that to transition um, that is doable for me. But you, you just have to get the land into, I think, in this state. And that takes a huge financial burden off um, of what happens. And like I said, as, as things change, you can make changes to your estate plan if, you know, the child you expected to come home isn't the one that's coming home. You know, those things can be altered. But my advice, get the land, get the land protected, because that's the big piece. All right, Casey, we've talked about your personal experience, we've talked about what an estate plan is, when you should do it. We talked about unexpected things that came up for you, like when things happen out of order. Is there anything else you'd like to leave the people listening to this, to li listening to this podcast with before we wrap up? Yes. Thank you. Thank you for asking. I, I do have one more thing that I think is really important. You know, if I'm talking about a reason to do this, as somebody who has had to navigate grief, it is colossal and it is consuming and it is awful and it is drowning. And then when you add anything else to that, it becomes damaging and it becomes unbearable. And so I always tell people if for no other reason, Get an estate plan for the people that you love so that on the day that you die, all they have to do is grieve you. The fighting is done. Nobody has to figure it out. No one has to wonder. No one has to worry. You don't have to worry about potentially severing relationships between siblings or parents and children or parents and, you know, great parent, grandparents and grandchildren, whatever. Everybody knows it's all done. All they have to do is grieve you. And that's enough. Like that is the best gift that you could ever give to the people who love you is to set them up so that when the day comes and it's coming for all of us, all that's left is grief because that is, that's all they can handle. And so make sure that's all they have to handle. So well, on that positive note. <laughs> Well, did you have more you wanted to add? No, nope, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much, Casey. I appreciate you being on the show and opening up about your personal experience and what you learned there and also what you've learned from your professional experience as well. It was amazing. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me. Hey, folks, I have a message from our friends at the Red Angus Association of America. As input costs soar, beef producers are eyeing value-added programs to help reach their profitability goals. The Red Angus Feeder Calf Certification Program, the most mature value-added program in the beef industry, is expanding and helping more producers earn premiums on their calves. The FCCP combines three important components into a single value-added program, genetics, source, and age verification. 
Cattle producers recognize the value of the yellow FCCP tag and continue to see market topping premiums for a minimal investment by enrolling their Red Angus sired calves. And for those producers who seek age and source verification but are lacking the Red Angus sired component, be sure to check out the Allied Access Program, which is eligible to age and source verify every single calf born in the United States, regardless of breed. For more information on Red Angus value-added programs and the FCCP, please visit redangus.org and start opening new doors to marketing avenues and maximizing your return on investment. And that's a wrap on that one, folks. Thank you for tuning in today and joining in on the conversation. Be sure to take this a step further and take the advice you learned and implement it on your operation. If you want to have a conversation about it, head over to my social media and send me a DM by following at Cattle Convos and connecting with me there. Have a great day.